Stella, um, for the introduction to the meeting. Great. Thanks, Lynn, and go that. It's nice to see everyone in the new year. Um, welcome, as Lynn said, to our first Regional Transportation Advisory Council meeting um, the new year. I'm just going to run through some quick MTO housekeeping items here. Um, so you are invited to participate in our transportation planning process, regardless of your race, color, national origin, including limited English proficiency, religion, creed, gender, ancestry, ethnicity, disability, age, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, veteran status, or background. Um, you can read the full note of your racing protections at www.austinmpo.org slash mpo underscore non underscore c-i-s-c-r-i-m-i-n-a-t-i-o-n. This meeting is accessible to people with disabilities. Zoom products are compliant with exceptions with the following standards. Web content accessibility guidelines, 2.1 level AA standards, and revised section 508 standards. If you require any additional accommodations in order to participate fully in this meeting, please contact me, Stella Jordan, at sjordan at ctps.org or at 857-702-3675. A couple guidelines here. Um, you should have joined the meeting with a muted microphone. You do have the ability to mute and unmute yourself, but please remain on mute unless you're actively speaking. Um, to participate in the discussion, please use the raise hand function. You can find this by either clicking in the participants button at the bottom of the screen and a window will pop up with a raised hand button at the bottom, or you can access it via the reactions button in the toolbar and one of us will call on you. And if you're joining us by phone today, you can use star nine to raise your hand. Um, we have kind of a full meeting, so I don't know if we'll do the whole full introduction, but um, if you'd like to take the time to introduce yourself in the chat, um, and please also rename yourself if you haven't already to include your first name, last name, and affiliation. Again, that's information you're also welcome to drop here in our chat. Um, and finally, if you're having Hello? any technical difficulties, um, please contact me via the chat box. Uh, you can also reach me at S J O. Hello, can you hear me at all? Oh, no, I can't hear. But uh, Anna, Christina, I can hear you. We can hear you. Um, but yes, you don't hesitate to contact me if anything comes up. Um, S Jordan at ctps dot org or at eight five seven seven zero two three six seven five. Um, and with that. Uh, I believe we're getting right into our presentation here since we have kind of a packed agenda today. Um, so I will turn it over to Len, Franny, and Susan um, talk about local transit funding and coordination challenges and solutions. Just thank you, Stella. And, and, and yes, as Stella said, because it's a packed agenda, we're just going to move right into um, the discussion presentation. And, and Franny, the vice chair, is going to run this part of the meeting. So Brandy, it's all yours. Hi. Um, I guess we're doing introductions on the chat. Um, if anybody has trouble seeing the screen, we didn't. Uh, well, I guess people would have told you, right, um, Stella, if they needed accommodations because they had low vision. Um, I, just, I would assume I. I think this the PowerPoint should be okay, but if anyone's having trouble, okay. please do reach out to me and I'll go try to troubleshoot. Yeah, tell us if um, it's hard to see. So I am a transportation volunteer that's been working on um, trying to improve local transit for about 17 years now. And um, I do it via my town of Acton or various regional groups. And at one point I started coming to RTAC because it was suggested by the outgoing select person who had been previously going and I had no idea what it is. And I find that most people don't. Um, and so every once in a while, so I, get, I tend to keep sort of being the person that keeps being a pest 
talking about community transit when we're looking at projects and when we're looking at funding in RTAC. And so that's what we're going to focus on today is how is it going um, in our communities? So um, do you want to change the, the slides, Stella? Is that what happens? OK, so what we're going to do, I was going to do introductions, but if we're doing it in the um, chat, that's all right. Um, I was just sort of curious if there are people here who are providers or users of more local rather than core MBTA. Um, well, let me so jump in, Franny, and say that sure. if you have factored that in I mean, to yeah. the time of your presentation, then by all means, go ahead and do so. I mean, how many people do we have here, though, um, Stella? It looks like we have 30 right now. I mean, so that yeah, would so probably it, it, take about 15 minutes of time. Yeah, I think I think we won't do that. But right. let me just ask, is there anybody that would like to introduce yourself and say something like why you're here um, having to do with um, local solutions for public transportation? You're just like we're burning. Okay. So, I'm just listening in. Okay. Um, so we can go to the next. So what we're going to do is actually on this slide, um, we're just going to look at the plethora of funding sources and options that people have and where the gaps are. And then Susan Barrett, the transportation director from Lexington will um, show some concrete examples of some of the challenges. And what I wanted to do is talk about how RTAC, what's RTAC's role in this? Um, and so part of what I did was, um, you'll see on the slides is take a little look again, what is RTAC again? <laughs> and what, what are we doing? So. Um, Excuse me if you know this, but like the back of your hand, Len. Um, and but I just think it's good every once in a while to sort of stand back and say, okay, who are we and what is our role here? Um, so you, you know, the next slide. Um, this is straight out of the bylaws. Um, we are the method for public participation in the three C transportation planning process. And I was shocked to see that we never even said what three C was in our bylaws anywhere. <laughs> we just said that we were the mandate, part of the mandate of three C. So on the next slide, I will. But on this, I just wanted to make, take note that um, we are supposed to be advising the Boston MPO on transportation policy and planning. Um, and that we have a variety of providers and users so what's interesting to me about that is that we don't necessarily, all these providers and users aren't necessarily planners. Um, a lot are the ones that work at the MPO are, um, and some of the people who are on the, the committee are, but by definition, we are not all, yet here we are trying to advise the MPO on policy and planning. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, the 3C is continuing, comprehensive, and cooperative. Um, you can go on. Um, and so here we are advising the MPO board. Um, I'm just going to go through this. That's why I asked if anybody couldn't see it. I'm just going to sort of slowly go through the, the next four slides just to remind us, what is the Boston MPO that we are advising? Um, it's responsible for, you can change, Stella. We have a vision. We develop a vision, the MPO does, um, and to figure out how to allocate the funds that improve roadway, transit, bicycle, and pedestrian infrastructure. That's a lot. Um, and we're focusing today on the transit in there and specifically the transit that's not in the core where there are lots of buses and trains. Okay, the next. Um, and the way the MPO shares that plan is through these long range transportation plan, et cetera. Okay, the next. It, it just tells geographically about what the MPO covers. Um, 97 cities and towns. And it says that 
Therefore, the planning has to take into account the demographic, cultural, and environmental diversity of the region. So what one of the reasons we wanted to have this discussion was, are we taking care of all the, that diversity in the region or not? And I look to you to give input on that. Okay, the next slide. So this is not a complete list. This is a list that are, is familiar to me. And this is how we get funded. There's a very big variety of funding. And if we think of a more top-down approach, as Susan will talk about later, it shows the challenge in doing that when we get funding for transportation from all these different methods. And the three dots are supposed to indicate that I might have missed a major source of funding for our transportation for local transit. Okay, the next um, slide. Um, these slides were put in here. I told Stella to put them anywhere because I just wanted to note when you look at what we spend money on from the MPO, a lot of it is infrastructure, sidewalks, the community, I mean, complete streets. I looked at the complete streets projects and they, most of them are sidewalks. And I was happy to see that being on the transportation committee in my town, sidewalks make me very happy. Um, but when I think about roadways and sidewalks and bridges, and um, I, I'm always struck with the small amount of the funding here that's focused on community transportation. We have the community connections program, but as you see, it's very small compared to the rest of the funding of the MPO. And I'm sure this is something that everybody knows why, um, except me, but I just wanted to point it out. Okay, so the next two slides are more on that. Most of it is complete streets and infrastructure and very little, the 2% is community connections. Um, and I suppose the transit modernization helps out people who are also taking vans and buses and first and last mile from the train in those smaller communities. But, okay, um, the next is the same. It's just other ways of looking at that data. Okay, go to the next slide. The reason I put all these like this, um, the transportation funding and the transportation options, not so you can um, study them, but so you see the major variety in all types of transportation that we need. So we have those variety of funding programs going into this variety of transportation methods. Same people, same community, um, but you can imagine the confusion in trying to sort out Luckily, when you're looking for a ride to the grocery store, you don't have to sort out where the funding's coming from, but you do need to sort out what's the timing and whether you are eligible for this trip and what's the best way to do that and whether it's running and whether you got there on time to ask for this trip, et cetera. Um, I also want to note the word school in the bottom left. Susan can mention that. Um, I'm always encouraging Susan to speak on this because. I think your ideas, Susan, are um, very important about the amount of funding that we put into school transportation and how much inefficient it is that we have a parallel um, transportation system that's underfunded and hard to access. Um, go to the next slide. Um, this is Oh, we're almost to where we're going to look at concrete examples of what I'm talking about, this confusion of um, what's available and how it got there. Um, when Kelsey Magnuson started at Emerson Hospital as the community benefits coordinator, I was talking to her a lot about our whole transportation infrastructure in the Acton Concord area. Um, Emerson Hospitals in Concord and MBTA is to the right. Um, the other lines represent the RTAs and Crosstown Connect, which is a 
Transportation Management Association in that area. She didn't know how to even get started trying to work with the system because we all come from different um, RTAs or MBTA. Um, it's just it, it's just a mishmash, and you know, after working on this for seventeen years, I can understand it. But um, most people out there looking for the ride to the grocery store, it is not evident. You can go into the next slide. The other list I wanted to put was some of the gaps and challenges that happen, um, the difficulties. You know, you get out of working at a hotel at eleven at night or three in the morning. Um, how do you get home? You, etc. You you know it. I know because there are a lot of transportation professionals um, in the room, so I don't need to tell you these. But I wanted to put these lists just to sort of throw the problem out in the air um, to inform our discussion. But now I want to hand it to Susan. Go into the next slide, please. Um, it, Susan pointed out this, these two illustrations, which were part of the report that 128 Business Council did um, for Lexington when they were trying to improve intertown connectivity. So we don't want all these parallel vans and TNCs and microtransit um, parallel to the fixed route, all doing the same thing. Go to the next slide. Um, this is more of a macro vision of taking advantage of our fixed route, making the fixed route more usable for everybody and having those other smaller programs support that fixed route. Okay, go to the next slide. Um, I'm going to hand it to Susan, Director of Transportation from Lexington, um, to give concrete examples of what I'm trying to um, give a feel for. Because what I really want from this discussion this hour is that we throw out ideas for how we could move forward in a better way than we have been to support that community transportation. Um, thank you very much, um, Franny, and um, thank you to RTAC and MPO for hosting this today. I'm so excited you're um, discussing this topic. Um, I. The reason I'm excited about it is I want to actually first give you an analogy um, that I hope is helpful in case maybe you're not directly experiencing uh, some of the situations we're talking about. Imagine having a cut on your arm that won't stop bleeding. And so you have to keep applying bandages. And in the process of that, you realize some bandages are too big, some are too small, some are too sticky, some don't stick enough. Um, some are more absorbent than others and so forth. And then you realize, oh, and you have to keep buying the bandages and come up with a schedule to buy them and whatever. And you put all this energy into figuring out how to deal with the bandages that you kind of lose sight of the fact that your arm is still bleeding. And sometimes I wonder if that's maybe where we're at with transportation is we just need to step back and look at what is the underlying issue here and what is the most holistic way to address it? <laughs> now, hopefully some of that will make sense. My brain thinks with analogies. Hopefully some of that will make sense as we go through this. And um, Franny or Stella, um, before I dive into these concrete examples, I was wondering if I could share the image that we talked about earlier today. It's kind of buckets of funding and gaps. So if I, it's just that one um, image I have, if I have ability sure. to share okay I have yeah, that ability. Ability. we could we can stop sharing the screen if you want to be able to look at more people also oh no 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 it's okay i the screen okay. is actually helpful for me um okay. i cannot screen share all right it's i Are, could maybe oh, do it, it actually oh. if stella stops sharing that one you'll be able okay. to it's I just one slide it won't take very long it should work susan <laughs> all right. i like that slide um do you guys see a a slide that says goals of the project Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, so this was a slide that was when we were talking about a regionalization um, project that we got funding for. Um, I realize this, the image might be a little small, but hopefully this helps you visualize part of the issue. There's all these different buckets for funding transportation services. They're all separate, most often operating in silos. And yet in between, we have a lot of gaps for people where they just can't access transportation, just can't get them where they need it to go. 
but then you also end up with some duplicative service, much like the um, uh, image that Franny just showed. So just wanted to share this because I think it gives you, hopefully it gives you another sense of the problem. Um, okay, and now I'm, if you're okay, I'll stop sharing and you can go back to the slide. Sure. Your slides, thank you. And um, while that's coming up, I'll just say the reason um, I was sharing the slide I, I just did, it was something that was created for a committee we have in Lexington explaining this regionalization project. Because the town has been working on regionalization for almost five years. And I'll talk about that um, related to our Tritown Transit. But as I think about all that we've been trying to do with regionalization, again, I stop and think, now, wait a minute, I'm one staff person in a relatively small department, human services, of a relatively small town that's trying to somehow push the needle on regionalization. Yet meantime, we have regional planning entities and regional transit agencies. And I just wonder what more could be done, again, with a little bit more top down um, organization and assistance. So the Tritown Transit, to talk about that, um, in 2017, the town of Lexington received a state grant called the Efficiency and Regionalization Grant. Um, and it was to work with the towns of Bedford and Burlington, um, along with us, to regionalize our array of transportation services. This came about from a suggestion of a Middlesex Three Community Compact Study where our three towns were on the southern end of that area. And um, it was a suggestion, one of many, that well, maybe these towns should just band together, see if they can merge their resources to have more connected transportation. Everybody is very excited about this project. Um, we had they are the town managers we had at the time, which have all since retired, were super engaged in this process. Everyone had big dreams and hopes. They were talking about all the trying to fill all the needs that exist, you know, late night hours and so on. Um, but when it came down to it, um, people didn't want to spend any more money than we were already spending on our transportation services. And there was no way to go from what our what we have as bare bones service to much greater service, right? We could connect our services, but since we were so bare bones, like for example, Burlington had one bus doing 12 routes, like you, you just can't get great service when you just merge together. Um, we looked at doing microtransit, just getting rid of any fixed route um, in our area and, and going, um, putting all our resources into microtransit, that was significantly more expensive. And for some of our services, it meant serving less people per vehicle hour than we were, um, than we were with uh, the services we had. So we really looked at everything and um, we knew we had to kind of go somewhat back to the drawing board. So we are still attempting um, through other means to see what we could do on regionalization. But um, the fact is we always come back to town saying like, but where's the money? Um, and I, I'm gonna go through these other examples and then just give you some more specific concrete examples in regards to some funding challenges. All right, another example, um, the second one, getting to Bedford VA from the Lowell Regional Transit uh, Authority area. So there's a group of us, it's actually kind of a large group. I think we've had as many as like 15 people trying to come together to figure out how to get veterans from the north to the Bedford VA. The area where the Bedford VA is, it is served by the MBTA number 62 bus. It is the last stop on that bus that comes from Cambridge. Um, and travels through Lexington there. Um, but that doesn't connect to Lowell Regional Transit. Um, the town just to the north of Bedford, Bill Ricca, is in the LRTA area. And we have veterans that would like to come down from that direction, but they really can't. So somehow they've got to get to the Lowell Regional Transit Authority and somehow get themselves <laughs> over to Cambridge or somehow to connect. It's just, it's crazy because there's just this tiny area and in between um, the LRTA and the MBTA, there's also the Middlesex Community College shuttle, which is shuttling students from Lowell to Middlesex Community College, which is right next to the Bedford VA. And it just seems with all this transportation, um, with these multiple transportation providers, there might be a way to better connect, but it's just not that easy. There's just a lot of challenges involved. Um, 
Now I'll give you a couple of uh, COA, uh, Council on Aging service examples that I've heard of. So um, in our community, we have uh, many towns that are um, have Council on Aging vans, um, which can be a great service, you know, to help fill some of the gaps in a community. But they, of course, face many, many constraints as well. Um, one of our neighboring towns, they operate two um, vehicles um, during their service hours. However, they maintain four vehicles on hand. So they have twice as many vehicles in service as they have in their backup fleet, which is a high ratio. Normally you want roughly like 20% of your vehicles as your backup fleet, but they do that because um, being maintained and operated by the town, their DPW doesn't have the capacity to always um, maintain their vehicles as quickly as needed. In addition to that, um, even though they're a town that borders us, they struggle to get their um, seniors to Leahy Burlington, which is a popular medical destination for them because it's just too far when you're doing all demand response, that back and forth, it just takes a lot of time. We've offered to allow them to transfer to our like express bus service, which is fixed route and goes to Leahy every hour. And then maybe, hey, maybe our friends could, um, transferred to their town. Um, but this is a, this has some challenges as well. It's just a different way for them to think and operate. Um, and, uh, and similarly, another a neighboring COA has a challenge where um, they have some of um, their seniors would like to go to the grocery store more often than the once a week trip that the COA van allows. We'd be willing to have them, if they can get to our vehicle, take them up to the market basket. Um, but again, it's right now, it's very hard at the moment. It's like challenging to think about those partnerships or trying to chip away, but it's just when you've been operating differently for a long time, it's just a challenge. All right, I'll try to speed it up here. The plethora of service, but limited to certain people only. I'm gonna give two examples here. Um, I had a gentleman call me from Waltham. Waltham is the town to the south of Lexington. He wanted to apply for a job at a gas station in Lexington. I had nothing for him. We have no fixed route transportation from Waltham to Lexington. He's not a senior citizen. He's not a person with a disability. Um, he couldn't hop on like a Waltham COA van or anything like that. There was nothing to help him get to his uh, this job um, that he was considering in Lexington, other than he'd have to find a way to get all the way to Cambridge and come back out. Another um, example in um, South Lexington, um, so kind of near that Waltham border, we have actually a lot of services that are going to Alewife. We have um, a couple multifamily complexes that have their own direct service to Alewife for their residents only. We have a senior living facility, which will make a couple trips to Alewife for their residents. We have a private um, business that has their own shuttle bus for their specific employees. And then we have a commuter shuttle um, from our Transportation Management Association. Thankfully, they make theirs open to the public, except it's a reverse commute. It's coming from Alewife to Lexington. So we get complaints from Lexingtonians like, hey, I'd like to get a ride to Alewife. And I see all these shuttles going to Alewife, but I can't ride them. <laughs> so I think we need to think about that. And then the last thing, last uh, example about um, service challenges. I've, I um, do a lot of counseling with um, seniors um, and people that maybe are no longer able to drive or just get around independently anymore. And we like to explain all their options. And what I find is I give them a very large toolbox and I wish it weren't quite as heavy. <laughs> it's nice to have a lot of tools, but sometimes you just wanna find the right tool. You want it to be easy to find and use. Um, and I find that, you know, I tell them about options for getting to medical appointments. Well, okay, here's this lovely program we have, but the thing to know about it is you have to call exactly two business days in advance, exactly between the hours of nine and one. You should ideally call by 9 a.m. because it's first come, first serve. And then I talk about their backup options. If that doesn't work, but that's limited, you only get so many rides or so many vouchers, limited hours, and so on. I find that someone in that position, I, I do refer them a lot to the ride, which for us is our ADA paratransit. They may or may not qualify, it depends on, um, well, you're familiar with what the eligibility requirements are. And I do that not just because it is another tool, but I also hope that maybe it can kind of become more of like their one-stop shop 
I, I know um, I'm not trying to like kick the can to another service. It's just that I think just knowing how complex this can be when you have to parse out who you can get your transportation from and it's all these different providers and some people are even, you know, they might even have mass health sort of like in there as well that they have to kind of divvy up their rides. It's just challenging. If it could be more of a one-stop solution or just less, <laughs> uh, less to muddle through, I think that would be great. Um, before you move on, I'm not quite sure what your next slide is, <laughs> I don't remember, but I wanted to just give an example of some funding challenges because Franny did mention those. Um, and she had a long list of funding opportunities, which sounds fantastic, but I'm going to comment on a few of them and how they don't always fit the need. So for example, right now in Lexington, we are facing a budget challenge as, I, as probably many towns are due to rising costs and so many things, um, for us energy, um, trash costs and so on. And um, so we are being asked to reduce our transportation um, service budget. Um, so we will have to, if, if that is the final situation, we will have to reduce our bus service, which is three buses down to two. Um, for a little history, it was actually a four bus service um, when it started in 1979 um, and it used to operate Monday through Saturday. Um, now, 40 plus years later, it's a three bus service Monday through Friday, and it may go down to being a two bus service, despite the fact that we have more people, more congestion, more seniors. Um, but there's still, um, and, and more revenue, but there's still this challenge of how do you fund services? So our general fund, which is what predominantly funds that service, um, is a little strained. Um, you know, we of course have prop two and a half, but the other thing is as a municipality, we have a lot of competing interests. We have to fund our fire department. We have to pay for trash, have to pay for schools, police, so on. So there's a lot of um, competing interests that can make that challenging. We have um, a TDM fund, Transportation Demand Management Fund. So as a new developer comes in, we may extract um, some fees from them that would go into this fund that would help to um, fund transportation alternatives. The only challenge is all those fees are one time only. So it's really hard to fund an ongoing um, service. Um, and then I'll just point to a couple other um, opportunities that were listed on that chart. The Community Connections Grant um, through the MPO, you know, that's great, but it's for new service only. It's not meant to sustain you long term. So we need to figure out how do we sustain, sustain things long term. And then the MB, MBTA Supplemental um, Transportation Options Program. So that's what initially helped to fund our Lexpress bus service um, back in 1979, but the funding for that has dropped over the years. Of course, costs have risen and the MBTA just doesn't have um, funding to fill every, every gap and, and support every transportation option. Um, so those are uh, some examples, hope that's helpful. <laughs> and so I go on to the next slide. Yes, it's the about your ideal system. And I wanted to make sure you mentioned what you mentioned to me about thinking about like the 2050 plan, destination 2050, and how if we actually looked at like, how would each thing get funded? Um, as you're talking, Susan, I just want to note, it just seems so wrong that communities like Lexington and Acton have had to put a lot of municipal funding in, whereas other communities don't have that that drive and the um money <laughs> from the taxpayers to put into their systems um and they're part of regional transit authorities which in my mind should be the ones planning and providing all of this small town local transit we shouldn't have to create transportation management associations to do that or go to our taxpayers. Um, yeah, anyway, it just, so the top down, I just wanted to mention to you to um, mention that, but talk about your ideal, <laughs> the ideal system, and then we're going to move on. To, yeah, well, I um, mean, I, I I don't know. I, I don't know that I necessarily yeah. agree on the funding part. I think I think we all have to do our part, and I think those that can you know can pay more should pay more. But um, I oh in this yeah, which may be what you were saying, but I, I don't know. But um. Um, but I think that's that's just a challenge getting there. So 
um, especially, I think this might be particularly relevant as you're going through the 2050 plan. The one thing I've been hoping for is an actual plan that isn't just lofty goals, but literally lays out where do we actually want, you know, fixed route network to be, you know, from the tracks to the bus service, you know, the high frequency corridors, the lower frequency service. And I realized we just had bus network redesigned for those of us in the MBTA area. But even with that, was that really the most ideal system that could be imagined? Or was that more um, constrained? Um, I think we have to ask that question. Actually, the MBTA advisory board, I know, has, has asked that question. Um, but then, even let's say, even if that is the most ideal system, there's so many gaps both outside that MBTA um, core and in between. So how do we want to deal with those and who should operate them? We really need to, I think, spell out when does it make sense for service to be operated by the MBTA um, or another RTA? When does it make sense for it to be operated by a TMA? And when does it make sense to be operated by a municipality or someone else? I really think we need to plan that out and look at what we're going to do with the areas where there's some agency overlap, such as um, the area I mentioned near the Bedford VA. Um, next. All right, well, I guess I answered these, yeah. So, <laughs> so how can we deal with the gaps? I think we need a more organized plan um, and, and that plan should um, provide for funding. I think when we come up with this plan, we have to make sure that everything helps us to carry out this plan, our policies, um, you know, our, our procedures, the way we view funding, the grant opportunities and so forth so that we can better serve the diverse array of needs um, that are in our community. And next, all right. And I guess I hand it over to Franny, or Franny and Len. Thank you so much. So during, yeah, during this discussion, um, I wanna just hear from all of you um, because we've talked enough. Um, what way, for, first of all, what's the role of RTAC? And that's why I wanted to review at the beginning. Well, um, and Amira wants to go back one slide. So do, Amira, do you wanna say something about that before we go on? The discussion? No, not in particular, but I definitely okay. am in support of what, everything that Susan said. And I want to take down some specific notes on some action plans because, like she said, the advisory board and us, we've had different conversations. So this is definitely in our agenda. Oh, excellent. Um, the So now you, can we go forward again? Okay. Um, what's the role of our TAC? Because here we are. At, RTAC in thinking about the regional community transportation um, program and improving it to make it less fractured, more coordinated, less duplicated, and more efficient. Um, so I just want to hear from everybody, anybody, um, about what you see, what, what ideas come up as we're talking. And we're obviously not going to solve it during this 25 minutes, but we um, would like to have an idea of what we could do to move forward and what we could do from our tax to make a little bit of difference in this area um yes yeah. hi christina hello i just i i was listening in and i was thinking to myself you know perhaps there's little um way you can convince them because of operational costs but maybe if you push i don't know what the regionalization program is but if you push to get electric vans, maybe that would help, you know, reduce costs, operational costs anyway, like gas and whatnot. I mean, you'd still have maintenance and wear and tear, but it would be, you can maybe increase the frequency of the routes and you have the one time upfront fee so we could support these smaller you know, municipalities having funding for electrical vans and whatnot for routes. That's just an idea. Thank you, Len. So our role is whatever we want it to be, you know, and so it's really up to us. And, and, and I think what we can do and should do is just keep this show in the front burner and, and, and just be, be, just keep working it. And, um, and if we see a, an opportunity to um, make some progress, be, then we try and make progress be, uh, along um, whatever that 
opportunity is. I have a question though, and, and this is in terms of like helping us to maybe not reinvent the wheel. I mean, so there was a report in, in 2019 in, on um, regional transportation. It was done by uh, a task force I mean, and they had like 27 or 25 recommendations. Do we have a sense of what happened um, with, with that initiative I and mean, after the report was done? Do you know what I'm talking about? I'm I'm not sure which report. Does somebody else here? Was it a mass dot report? Yes, mass dot report. Yeah, let me see if I can bring it back up. I kind of lost the screen that I had it on. Uh, well, I, I can I can send it out. I'll I'll try and put it in the chat. I'm on a different um, laptop. Oh, I mean, but but um, it, it it seems like it really explored the issue. Susie, are you aware of this report I'm talking about? By Susie, do you mean me? Yeah, I'm sorry, Susie. I'm sorry. <laughs> Only my um, mom calls me Susie, but that's okay. I'm sorry. I'm um, no, sorry. no, it's no, it's no problem. I, I, yeah. um, <laughs> it's okay. Um, I'm so I'm not sure which one you're specifically talking about. I do know there's been lots of reports. Sometimes they're just for sub regions, um, mm. so I'm not sure which one you're referring to. And and I just want to clarify though what I'm hoping for, and I don't know if anyone from MPO uh, can address this. Is can we? actually get a plan where we literally map out actual services and then specifically figure out what we're going to do with the services that fill in the gaps. I have not seen anything that looks like that. And I, I so I doubt right. the 2019 plan has anything like that. But, okay. it's, but again, it's called, my idea may not be the best. But that's just what I'm thinking. Thanks. So it's called a vision for the future of Massachusetts regional transit authorities. Uh, it was a report of the task force on the RTA performance and funding April 5th, 2019. Oh, yeah. Yes, um, I was on that commission. So it was commissioned to review the funding and the whole administration of um, RTAs. And one of the things that came out of that um, was a push for, well, there were a lot of, yeah, we have to keep on looking at that. Um, one of the things that came out was some RTA legislation that didn't pass last year, but um, we should continue to push for it. Um, and a request for more funding for the RTAs. So that's a really good, will you link us to that report? Sure, sure. That'd be wonderful. To to, I think another, Ethan, thanks for Ethan put it in the chat. Us. Yes. Yeah. And another um, thing we can do is work with um, the, the transit working group I mean, that the MPO um, set up. I mean, but I think the important thing is just to keep it on the front burner. I mean, so so that last year I'd asked you because it's not that you bug us. I mean, it's a good thing that we um, focus on this. And I asked you to kind of lead the charge on helping the advisory council to keep this on the front burner. Uh, but now as yeah. vice chair, I mean, hopefully it'll be easier for you to do that. And we'll okay. continue pursuing this issue. Thanks. Great. Thank you. I'm Lil from North Reading. So thank you to ladies for very eloquently putting my challenges to words. Um, <laughs> North Reading is um, a community with a ridiculous number of overlapping authorities and associations and yet very little service. So we're in a great opportunity zone to think about like, what would we want from scratch? Because we are pretty much at scratch. Um, and um, I, I would just like to say it, through about 30 meetings in the past three months with our state models and local partners. Um, what I'm most excited about um, is the potential for things like the SEAM Collaborative, which is a special education consortium of 11 towns that contract transportation jointly. Um, and also looking at things like the way PT1 transportation is managed by MART and has 300 vendors on one dispatch system. Um, those concepts really seem to work well because I don't want to send a driver from North Reading to Boston and wait for an appointment. But if we as a large group are working together that there will be a driver from our contract in the place where they need to be on time. And I'm not going to be wasting hours and serving two people a day. Um, so I'd love to be part of your small working group and part of your pilots and uh, share everything from my experience with you, if that would be helpful. That's wonderful. 
we didn't even have a working group, but now we do. <laughs> um, thanks. I don't see any other hands up, but um, I, oh, sorry, I do see a hand, so I was going to chime in. But there's, I think you have Jen. Yeah, sorry, nothing like super substantive to to add, but I just wanted to like to the question of kind of what is the role and um, uh, just a uh, a note that like we could like. But like the, the the Boston region has been one of the forces that have like led to significant changes in how federal funding works and um and that we couldn't even flex funding to transit like we can now um from the feds um were it not for the highway protests and our um leaders kind of uh getting the federal government to to allow that. So I just wanna like I think it's really exciting to get to talk about re-envisioning things from scratch and I think we should also be thinking through kind of what what our role is but also like how can we connect with our like legislative leaders too because um just because things are very uh labyrinthine and complex and um, right now it doesn't mean that we can't um try to push for something that works better yes thank you um Amira Yes, thank you. So I just wanted to add that I've heard a lot of things said, but just to summarize, um, I did want to support Leonard's idea about keeping the conversation at the forefront. Um, we might be saying that this is the way that we have been doing things, but maybe without reinventing the wheel, we need to do something different. Um, and also, <laughs> I really want to say 30 meetings is a lot. I, and, and I want to drive that advocation is one of our major keys here in collaboration. Um, we should identify some of our allies that might be something helpful um, for an action plan and collaborate to get some type of working group together. We have so many different entities and subgroups and subregions, um, but definitely working towards like a bigger picture with action plans and things like that. So we, the MBTA advisory board, we are in support of all of this. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, the 30 meetings, that sounds like a lot of bandages going back to my analogy. Um, but um, in regards to moving forward, so we do have the um, MPO Transit Working Group that many um, service providers have been participating in. And I wonder if maybe that can be the structure um, to get us together. I, it was my hope when that came together and it, this was pre-COVID and we all got together in the transportation building, TMAs, RTAs, mun small municipal services like us, um, that this is what we were going to do, that we were literally going to like create a map of like where service should be, how it could be better coordinated and connected and how we deal with the gaps. I just hope we can do that um, now. Um, and then I think that if we can do that, and again, move in concert towards achieving these goals, um, then everything needs to fall in place, the funding and so forth. Um, and I, uh, if anybody wanted me to explain a little bit more about the school issue, like in school transportation, kind of the needs of schools um, and how that uh, kind of, I think could factor in, let me know, but I, I know we have a short timeline. Thanks. Um, Len. Yeah, I would say, um, Susan, and by the way, you can always call me Lenny. It, uh, a lot of people do. It, uh, 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 is, um, uh, let's have you come back and talk about that because I mean uh, I I know that we had email exchange about that and there's some things going on in my municipality um, regarding school transportation and uh, but I, I would like for us maybe um, work with the trans um, transit um, working group I know when that group was initially um, contemplated I mean there was concern on the advisory council that the that group should have been a part of the advisory council and uh, and and I mean, my hope was that. Be, uh, that transit working group would work more with the advisory council or the other way around. Certainly, I mean, the advisory council was uh, invited and expected to participate you know, um, in the meeting. So, so I think it'd be good to, to get that going again. And I, and I understand why there's been a little bit of a lapse. I mean, and, and I think um, uh, I forget the person at, um, at MPO, the CPS is that is taking that over from, from Sandy. So I'm sure that we'll get some momentum going on again. But respect to the MBTA, it, um, 
I think one of the emphasis should be also on me trying to connect more to the MBTA with regional service, whether it be RTAs or municipal bus services or whatever. And I think also we can push this as a uh, environmental justice and equity issue you know, and, 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 and use that to try to get more funding. But I think the important thing is to get you know, the coordination. You know, and I know that municipalities really appreciate the independence that they have, you know, but, but sometimes you know, we need an outside entity to help us be more coordinated because we just don't have the means on our own to see the bigger picture. So with the new administration, I mean, uh, maybe now's the time to try and make that clear to folks. And then it's just really a matter of who does that outreach. That's it, thank you. Right, thank you. Now I, now I um, messaged Katie to make sure she spoke up and I just, we only have about seven minutes left on this, but I, I'm, happy to hear from Katie and I'm happy to see in this room a lot of the people that I've worked with you know people like Travis and Rachel and many of you <laughs> um Scott Sedegas who obviously led our Crosstown Connect in our area but there's many many people in the room who whose opinions on this I just so value because you've been working trying to make these improvements for so long so I hope to continue this Katie Hi everyone, I'm Katie. I, I work for Via Transportation and we partner with um, Newton and Salem um, to help supplement um, transit gaps in their, or fill rather transit gaps in their areas. So attach, uh, helping people connect to MBTA service, um, rail, et cetera. Um, and funding is one of the biggest issues that we know that um, Newton and Salem both have and kind of continuing their services. Um, so I was really excited to see this conversation happen. Um, I have kind of a question and maybe a suggestion for um, something to look into. Um, our team at VIA has you know, been tracking the IIJA programs really closely um, and saw that I think in the in for the CMAC program, um, I think Franny, you might have mentioned that some of the funding for like community connections is just for initiating service, or maybe it was Susan who said this, um, rather than continuing them. Um, and I think that's partly because um. I might have this wrong, but partly because programs like CMAC um, had limited amounts of years. And oh, sorry, IIJA is the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Um, so that was from a, a few years ago. It wasn't the, the latest big um, kind of infrastructure bill, but the one before then. Um, and thank you, CMAC. I realize I'm throwing out all of these acronyms is congestion mitigation um, and air quality. And both of these provide um, funding to large metro areas. Um, that allow investment in transit as well as you know, different kinds of roadway infrastructure projects and things like that. Um, so um, what I was trying to say is that I think that CMAC was changed slightly in, in order to allow ongoing projects. So you actually could provide funds for um, a project that was going on for five to 10 years as opposed to a shortened period of time. So I'm not sure if that's something worth exploring. Again, it's a limited pot of funding. So, you know, it, it couldn't be spread across the entire um, metro area on every, um, you know, potential project, but something that that could be explored. The other is the carbon reduction program, which is a brand new program um, that came out of the Infrastructure Investments and, and Job Act. Um, and I don't know, I haven't heard too much. I think a lot of people are still trying to figure out this program. And uh, about 35% of that funding goes to the state of Massachusetts, but then the other 65% goes to MPOs um, and um, councils of governments across the state. So it was just curious um, what the Boston MPO had been thinking about in terms of using that funding. Could we you know, find ways of directing a big chunk of it towards transit. I know other states have, you know, found ways of even using congestion or sorry, carbon reduction funding to add lanes to highways. I know Boston won't be doing that, um, but would love to certainly see a lot of that funding going towards transit. Do you find that VIA is, how is it going in Newton <laughs> and Salem? 
I guess, in a nutshell. I mean, it's it. it's gone really well. I, it, this is where we've seen a ton of demand. We launched during, um, for both, um, well, for Newton, we had been going before the pandemic, but for both Newton and Salem expanded um, service during the pandemic um, and have been serving tons of writers. There's lots of demand, um, all different kinds of ages writing the service, but one of the major challenges is funding year over year. So both Salem and Newton have used, you know, uh, city funds in order to launch their service. Newton did use the community connections program, um, which they were you know, very grateful to have in order to help them expand. Um, but to find that kind of sustainable funding stream and keep it ongoing. Um, and, you know, at, to Susan's other points of like figuring out how to knit that in and make sure that it's making connections to other transit options and, and you know, provide a really good net. Um, th those are ongoing challenges, I would say. Um, so yeah, biggest challenge is how do we fund this in, in perpetuity and make it something that's sustainable. Okay, let's just have one more. Um, thank you for speaking up from Michelle. Yeah, hi. Can you, can you, oh, sorry to interrupt. Um, Stella, can you move it to the next one because it has email addresses of Susan and me, thanks. Okay, yeah, Michelle. Oh, yes. Thanks, Franny. Um, and I, I just I'm a member of MPO staff. I, I wanted to kind of come back around to uh, the comment, Katie's comment about the, the carbon reduction funds. And this ties into our, our long range transportation plan a little bit, um, which we'll be talking about later in the meeting. Um, one of the things that we've been working on as part of that plan and kind of digesting um, the bipartisan infrastructure law and all the programs that are housed with it. Um, is kind of doing like what funding sources support, what kinds of eligibility, and how does that line up with our existing investment programs and kind of what are, you know, our opportunities to make changes. So we continue to kind of watch as guidance comes out and certainly the, you know, it's ex potentially expanded um, CMAC provision in terms of, you know, the length of time that operating assistance can be made available is something we're definitely going to keep watching. Um, in terms of the carbon reduction, um, and I don't know if uh, Derek Cravat is here, but I, I believe we're kind of waiting for additional guidance um, from MassDOT about how, you know, that those funds that can be spent um, and what that looks like with um, within MPO regions. So we're, we're kind of continuing to monitor those things. So these things are being factored into our long range transportation plan as we're, we're thinking about the future. Thank you. Um, oh, John, why don't you quickly speak? We haven't heard from you, so it would be nice to. Um, and then, and then we will end. And it sounds. I just wanted to sum up that I think that what sounds like we want to use the transit working group and also um, ask Len to sort of apply some of our time at RTAC to address some of these issues. That, that, that's sort of the um, suggestions I heard for moving forward and maybe having a subgroup of people from this committee. And I heard Amira say she'd be willing to work with me and Susan and anybody else. Or did, oh, no, no, maybe it wasn't. Yeah, it was Amira. Um, and if Lil, you wanted to work on anybody who's here um, to make sure we keep moving on these questions because we've been repeating these questions so many years. Um, so John, is it? last comment yeah hi uh, thanks um and this is really just an, an observation and possibly too idealistic but uh, it seems as though we're going to be chasing our tails per, in perpetuity um with this it's just based on the history of uh, massachusetts and home rule 351 towns that demand to be 351 towns OK, um, it's going to be <laughs> we're not going to solve the disjointed problem, the lack of cohesion, the silos, the, you know, the funding isolations uh, and the perceptions of what are fundamental rights for a populace in the state. So uh, that's that's just something I think either to consider or to deal with somehow, but I, I don't see how we're going to solve anything within that context right now that we're talking about, at least long-term or short-term, but uh, I, I remain optimistic. 
<laughs> I, I missed what the idealistic part. I heard the um, cynical part, but I missed what the idealistic part was. Y the 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 idealistic part. I like is, to end on that. Is 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 way too. It's it's too revolutionary. I think to be be absorbed. Uh, it would just be for Massachusetts to identify that let's say transportation. Uh, and access is a fundamental human right and uh, for all the population and that within that uh, safety and equity uh, need to feed, be fed into that. And it needs to be a comprehensive system from the bottom up versus the top down, but the top down having to be a cohesive uh, plan that really affects everyone at grassroots level. Yeah. And that could nope. cause another revolution. There are a lot of people that want to decentralize or not decentralize, but uh, have home rule forever. And uh, yeah. maybe that's some of the right wing conservatives, but um, it would be a revolution. Anyway, that's uh, quasi, no, I like quasi, that. Qu quasi optimistic. It's, I, it's never too idealistic for me. So um, thank you, everybody, for participating and Susan for helping me and. Len for setting up this hour and sure. Stella Thank for you. all your help. Really appreciate it. Um, yes. And, and so, the revolution begins with our attack, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 anyway, so oh, it begins with Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, John, John, I'm Steve McQueen. <laughs> so, John. So okay, well thank you everybody. And so we're gonna we're gonna move along here. Uh, and and just to get us some time back, I mean, I mean I'm gonna skip the chair's report. It's a short meeting. This was supposed to be a short meeting until we got to uh, uh, um, discussion about the adoption of mass dot um, standards mean for um, for I'm sorry, I had the screen up uh, for safety and, and I forget the other metric mean. Uh, but anyways, I said I was going to pass uh, up on the the chair's report just to save us some time. So let's um, go to the approval of the meeting minutes. And so we have the October 12th uh, and the March 9th um, meeting members minutes. And if enough folks have read them and, um, and want to make a motion in a second to approve them, and, um, I'll take that. Let me get my persistent screen up. So I'm not seeing a hand to make a motion. I believe we have a quorum, so we should be yeah. good on a vote if yeah. if folks were able to read those minutes yeah. posted on the yeah. calendar. Yeah. I'm getting the electronic hand too because I just can't see everyone in the grid. It, it, yeah, Franny, you were going to say something? Yeah, no, I, I didn't get, I was so busy preparing for this. I that's didn't good. get to read them, so that's why I'm not, but I was thinking I could go and read them quickly during well, no 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 well i guess we, we can circle back to this maybe at the end of the meeting if we want otherwise maybe we'll have more to approve in the next meeting and and uh, i'll quickly ask me for um for public comments i mean i don't want to skip by that in case someone wanted to make a public comment okay you know i'll i'll, I'll need an electronic hand raise Okay, uh, I'm not seeing that anything. Um, so, any um, members um, with members' items in their business? And the reason I'm doing that is that we're just going to let uh, the next part of the agenda um, run uh, at least until 4:30. But I don't want any, for people who were waiting to do old business or I'm sorry, new business or a member item to miss out on an opportunity to do that. Okay, not seeing it. You know, so. Uh, we're now going to move on to Destination 2050 Planning Framework Workshop with um, Michelle Scott. Michelle? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, my name is Michelle Scott. I'm the Long Range Transportation Plan Manager um, for the Boston Region MPO. And what I'm hoping to do today is kind of continue a conversation we started back in the fall um, related to um, the development of a vision 
and a set of goals and objectives for our next long range plan. Um, you, a number of you were at a meeting in October where you provided some really helpful feedback and we've about just the broader questions of, of visioning for the region. And we've been working with that feedback and feedback from other sources to try to distill um, a draft that we can use to advance our plan. Um, and so we're hoping to, to talk more specifically about that draft with you today. On the meeting calendar uh, for today's meeting, um, and I think I can post a link in the chat unless Stella, you have that. Um, there is a memo that um, we can refer to through the course of the discussion. Um, it includes kind of a cover explanation of some of the thinking that went into putting the draft together, which I'll go over as part of the presentation. It includes the current draft vision goals and objectives for Destination 2050. And it also includes the, the goals and objectives and the vision for our, our current plan that's active now, Destination 2040. Next slide, please. So kind of setting some goals um, you know, about this conversation is kind of looking at the, the framework that we've put together and really focusing on the questions of what looks good as is, you know, what kind of elements should we refill, refine or build on, um, where might we want to change course, and there's a number of specific discussion questions that are also included in the memo. So to the degree that you know we have time and interest in discussing some of these, you know, we can definitely dig into those. Um, sorry, just a moment. Um, next slide, please. So just to give uh, a rundown of the presentation, I'm going to give um, a brief overview of what the Long Range Transportation Plan or LRTP is for those may, that may not be familiar. Um, I'll talk specifically about the planning framework as a term I use as shorthand for our vision goals and objectives, talk about what role that framework plays in the MPO's process, talk about some of the inputs that went into our draft and our approach, kind of run down the, the features of what our drafts looks like, and then we can kind of have a discussion and collect your feedback. Um, and I'll close out with some next steps. Next slide, please. So the LRTP is within kind of the, the MPO's um, planning uh, operations. What this plan does is it provides the vision and goals, which we'll be talking about today, for the Boston Region Transportation System over the next 20 years or so. And I like to think of this kind of like a compass. I know talking um, in the previous agenda items about some of the challenges we face in coordination and funding, um, our challenges, certainly we face at the MPO level as well, trying to think about how we can navigate federal programs and administrative challenges and implementation challenges to kind of get where we want to go um, to the degree that that's possible. So this is kind of the exercise to develop our compass to do that. So the LRTP ultimately is a tool for prioritizing major projects and investment programs to meet the vision. So kind of distinguishing from some of the um, ideas discussed in the last section, it's more of a policy plan as opposed to a specific network plan. We try to look at challenges in different parts of the region and for the region overall, and you know discuss how those inform some of the policy decisions that we're making, but I just wanna distinguish between those two types of plans. Um, you see kind of the implementation of this plan in action through um, the MPO's selection of specific transportation projects, be they complete streets, um, intersection, bicycle and pedestrian amenities, um, through the annual decisions the MPO makes about the Transportation Improvement Program, or the TIP, as well as the studies and research um, that MPO staff um, and others do through the Unified Planning Work Program. This is a plan that we update every four years. Our current active plan is Destination 2040, which we adopted back in 2019. And the plan we're developing now is Destination 2050. Next slide, please. So just kind of a, a big old picture of some of the activities that we're working on um, over the next uh, couple months to produce this plan. Um, include identification of needs, the creation of this framework, um, identifying strategies, particularly by um, revisiting the MPO's investment programs and major projects, 
Um, and, you know, the investment programs, I think Franny alluded to in some of her introductory slides as those kind of buckets for how the MPO channels funding um, to different types of projects. Um, beyond that, you know, figuring out how much money should go to each of those projects or programs, you know, documenting the decision making process and, of course, um, engaging stakeholders, members of the public, you know, partner transportation agencies throughout the process. And, of course, for us coming to the advisory council is a really big part of that. Next slide, please. And again, oh, yeah, you can skip ahead. That's okay. Um, so the, I'll talk a little bit about kind of what goes into the vision goals and objectives and kind of reiterate what they influence. So in thinking about, um, you know, setting a vision, identifying priorities, um, you know, we start, of course, with MPO member feedback, you know, talking extensively with the members about what their, you know, interests and concerns are. Um, there's also, you know, the process of collecting partner and public input about priorities, and I'll talk a little bit about more about some ways that we're doing that in a minute. Um, there's, of course, partner plans and policies as well. Um, and finally, drawing from MPO staff, you know, experiences doing research, their you know, technical expertise as transportation planners, all of these are the ingredients for shaping this framework. And again, it guides investment programs. We wanna make sure that we're designing uh, programs that align with the goals that we set out for ourselves. Um, for projects specifically, you'll see these objectives kind of carried through to project and study selection criteria. And also this is overall framework is a way that the MPO can convey its values to partners, stakeholders, the public about you know, what we're trying to achieve in terms of transportation. Next slide, please. I'm going to walk through a couple of the ingredients that I mentioned um, on the previous slide, uh, starting with kind of MPO member and advisory council feedback. Um, we got a lot of um, feedback on different aspects of the um, way we could produce the goals and objectives. I want to highlight a couple high points, though we can certainly come back to others um, that came up uh, during the um, previous workshop we had, if you like. Um, the feedback we generally heard is that, you know, the existing structure um, of the vision goals and objectives that we have works. Um, there's a lot of emphasis that people are placing on safety, you know, resiliency to climate change, transportation equity, and of course, you know, reducing carbon emissions from transportation. You know, of course, there's, we want to stress that we want to find ways to make sure that we can use this framework and have tools to evaluate whether we're meeting our objectives or at least moving toward them. Um, thinking about greenhouse gases in particular, you know, being mindful that it's not just about electric vehicles, that mode shift and reducing VMT play an important role and, you know, arguably that should play the predominant role in achieving that. And of course, making sure we're aligned with the various other plans and goals that are set for the region, ranging from the Global Warming Solutions Act to the um, Strategic Highway Safety Plan to Metro Common produced by the Metropolitan Area Planning Council and things of that nature. Next slide, please. So one of the tools um, that we're using to collect some um, input from stakeholders and members of the public is a survey that we have out now. And, you know, towards the end of the presentation, I we can share more material about um, where you can find the survey if you'd like to take it or share it with their networks. But this is really kind of focused on um, the vision for transportation that people have for the region, as well as kind of specific priorities. And we're using the information that we're getting from this survey, not only to inform this framework, but, you know, the work that we'll be doing with the investment programs later on. Um, so this is a capture of, you know, one question, what are the three words that, you know, um, people would use to describe the transportation system? And you can see kind of some of the prominent things that are coming up, you know, having a system that's reliable, safe. Um, bike friendly, fast, um, frequent and affordable are some of you know those emerging themes that we're trying to make sure we account for in our framework. Next slide, please. Similarly, um, we have you know the a priorities question, and this table um, kind of outlines 
in the row across the top, some priority areas, and then the, the right hand column, uh, excuse me, left hand column shows the relative ranking, one being the best um, or, or highest importance, uh, nine being um, of the least importance. And I do want to stress that, you know, to some extent, all of these elements are important, but we wanted to see kind of how people rank them in terms of priority. Um, and the shading kind of indicates where more people um, rank something versus less. Um, and you can kind of see in the darker shading, um, you know, for things like transit access and reliability, walking and biking safety, these are things that people, you know, ranked very highly in terms of priority in a fairly consistent way, where you can see for things like greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution, you know, kind of more of a diversity of opinion. So this is all the kinds of feedback that we're, we're factoring into our process. Next slide, please. So again, just kind of reiterating some of those partner plans and policies. Um, and, you know, in the last discussion, we did talk a little bit about the bipartisan infrastructure law um, that's having a really big influence on really everything we do with the MPO, but, you know, the emergence of new funding programs and what their features are and kind of what the related goals of those programs are, you know, having a big influence um, on our process. And of course, we're looking uh, to, to state and regional plans as well as part of um, making sure that we're well coordinated. Next slide, please. So the last um, kind of ingredient category that I outlined is ideas coming from staff and, you know, we get different kinds of um, information, you know, to bring into this process um, and inform how we should structure our planning framework. Um, to some extent, we have our lessons learned from um, the updating our TIP criteria in 2020. Um, we also, are, you know, are thinking about what are new areas, emerging areas of need and planning practice. Um, so one of these items, which is kind of shown in the middle image on the slide, is kind of some metrics and visualizations related to um, destination access. So not just people's ability to access transportation services or infrastructure, but what we can learn about the, the time involved in people actually getting to where they want to go, um, be they specific job sites, um, schools, health destinations, and kind of understand, you know, access opportunities that people have um, and how we can improve those. And so emerging tools and resources, you know, are part of our thinking and how we can expand the role of things like destination access in our framework. And of course, we're also looking at, you know, areas where we're seeing just definite um, need and concern, you know, particularly around safety measures, um, particularly for vulnerable users like bicyclists and pedestrians, as well as resiliency to climate change. Next slide, please. Um, some of the principles that we're thinking about as we're trying to um, produce this framework, um, making sure that it clearly communicates MPO values, that we can measure or monitor it, as I mentioned earlier, that it's a good tool for MPO decision-making, that you know, the elements are integrated and they build on one another, the balancing aspirations and reality. And this is kind of a, a tricky aspect to consider when developing this framework. And also kind of constructing something that's flexible so that we can kind of adapt um, MPO process, respond to ways that we may want to or need to adapt MPO processes while still kind of fitting within our overall framework. Next slide, please. So again, just to kind of highlight the structure, and you can kind of see this in the um, kind of green, blue, orange graphic uh, labeled Destination 2050 in the um, cover memo, or excuse me, memo packet. And we have our vision, which conveys our hopes for the system and for the region overall, um, our goals, um, which are our aspirations for particular aspects of transportation. These, uh, within each goal area, we have a series of objectives that really kind of clarify specific actions, you know, designed to um, produce an outcome or even where the MPO is directing its attention and emphasis. And our performance-based planning and programming process is, is kind of a place where we can carry out um, the monitoring to see how we've been successful or where we might need to improve. Next slide, please. So just to kind of capture um, the draft vision statement, and we really kind of wanted this to be a, a brief pithy statement to kind of convey 
succinctly what's important um, in terms of transportation and for the region overall for the MPO. I'll just read it quickly, which is that the Boston Region MPO envisions an equitable, pollution-free, and modern regional transportation system that enables people to safely and reliably reach where they need and want to go. The system supports an inclusive Boston region that is healthy, resilient, and economically vibrant. Next slide, please. So again, moving from the vision to the goals, um, we have six goal areas. Um, and one of the things that we really tried to emphasize um, in the development of this framework, our process involved kind of um, looking back at what we had for Destination 2040 and figuring out you know, how we wanted to rearrange, re -emph change emphasis, things like that. So in our, in our existing planning framework, we have had um, an equity goal. And one of the things we did with this draft for our future framework is try to make sure that we not only have a standalone equity goal, but that we're reflecting equity in the objectives of each of the other goal areas, which is what this um, kind of puzzle piece graphic is meant to convey. Um, our other five um, goal areas are access and connectivity, safety, clean air and healthy communities, resiliency, and mobility and reliability. And I'll walk through each of these um, through our next couple of slides. So kind of starting a little bit further with equity, um, there are a couple objectives in here um, that relate um, in one sense to making sure that we're having an inclusive uh, planning process that involves um, people of you know, all backgrounds in meaningful ways, um, this equity goal is, you know, also the place where we clarify um, our definition of disadvantaged communities, and that definition kind of car uh, carries through our other goal areas. And really, you know, our major objectives are to, you know, maintain this inclusive engagement process and to both reduce harmful impacts on and improve outcomes for disadvantaged communities. And that's kind of the, the overarching piece that informs the objectives you see in the other areas. Next slide, please. So, you know, we had a safety goal again in our previous um, goals and objectives. Again, um, you know, and we're maintaining that goal um, in this uh, draft version for our new plan. But one of the things we tried to do here is really give this more of a, a vision zero orientation, um, you know, with the aim of um, over time achieving uh, zero fatalities and injuries on our roadway network. And this is really something that um, is responding both to, you know, vision zero framing that's becoming more prominent, both at the, the federal level and the state level as well. Um, and also aligns with work that um, we hope will be happening at the MPO soon. We've applied for um, a Safe Streets and Roads for All grant through the bipartisan infrastructure law, um, hoping to hear this um, month if the MPO was awarded that grant, and that would become funding to develop a regional safety action plan to kind of um, support Vision uh, Zero principles in the region. So to kind of relate to this, we have objectives for reducing safety outcomes and events for all modes. We talk a lot about um, uh, roadway safety, but transit safety is certainly a piece of that as well. Um, and making sure that we're eliminating disparities and outcomes for disadvantaged communities, overburdened areas, and vulnerable roadway users. Next slide, please. Um, our mobility and reliability goal um, captures a number of different themes um, that some of which were previous ha previously housed in other goal areas. Um, you know, the goal here is to have excellent mobility for people and, and freight. Um, you know, one of the things, and, and, you know, Len got an earful about this at our last MPO meeting is, you know, travel reliability, um, consistency, and predictability on um, our transportation system. So people know that they can rely on them and making sure that we're supporting that both for our transit system and our roadway system as well, really kind of leaning on non-SOV options to accomplish that. Um, part of infrastructure being reliable is making sure that um, in a it is in a state of good repair and that um, you know it's keeping up with you know opportunities to modernize it and make it better 
Um, and again, we really want to make sure zeroing in on that equity element that we're reducing disparities in reliability and frequency um, that disadvantaged populations may experience. Next slide, please. So access and connectivity kind of captures some objectives that we've previously had around closing gaps in networks, um, in um, you know access to you know specific transportation sites um, and um, infrastructure or access to transit. Um, you know, really trying, as I mentioned earlier, to kind of broaden that um, to. Um, you know, making sure that people have access to opportunity and to the key destinations that they're trying to get to by using our transportation network. And so we're really trying to leverage new tools and metrics to um, see how we're doing and use that as a guide to, to making that more of a part of the MPO's practice. Again, this is an area where we're emphasizing non-SOV options. Um, you know, we and in, in the last discussion, we talked a lot about, um, you know, the disconnects between transit services, the, the kind of inconvenience and barriers that people experience. And of course, you know, trying to direct MPO programs to so resolve some of those issues is important to us. And again, here, uh, emphasizing uh, frequent high quality transit and improving access um, to uh, um, key destinations for disadvantaged communities is included here as well. Next slide, please. So again, I referenced um, resiliency, and we have had res resiliency um, objectives um, in previous uh, planning frameworks, but we really wanted to bring this to the fore um, as a goal area, given the significance of you know, the effects of climate change and making sure that we're um, developing our transportation system in ways that make it resilient, that make it adaptable. Um, and you know, we're doing... Uh, work through our needs assessment in particular to really kind of um, capture and discuss, you know, the different um, hazards we're likely to face. And, and those are certainly reflected in our descriptions in this goal area. Um, you know, and we have, again, um, objectives related to making our infrastructure resilient, you know, making sure that we have a can support effective emergency response and evacuation. And of course, making sure that, um, Disadvantage and frontline communities, and often, you know, those overlap are, you know, receiving um, and being prioritized in the way we invest our dollars. Next slide, please. Uh, so the last of the six goal areas is um, clean air and healthy communities, um, and this is focused on, you know, providing transportation that's free of greenhouse gases and other air pollutants, and supporting um, sustainable environments and good health. And we're really trying to emphasize public health here um, as well. Um, and so we have a couple of objectives here um, that relate specifically to um, encouraging mode shift and um, reducing vehicle miles traveled from single occupancy vehicles. And this, these are topics that in previous sets of goals and objectives we kind of touched on, but we really wanted to make them clearer and more specific in developing this framework. Um, and again, you know, in terms of environmental burdens, be they from air quality or, you know, other negative impacts from transportation, we want to make sure that we're reducing them overall and that we're, you know, focusing on addressing in particular the burdens that um, disadvantaged communities may face. Next slide, please. So I just want to circle back. I mentioned and showed some results from um, our LRTP vision and priority survey. This survey is still open. Um, we're continuing to monitor uh, responses that come in from it um, as part of the uh, work we're doing to final out these vision goals and objectives. Um, there's a link here, and I'm sure that uh, we can provide that in the chat and some follow-up materials. It's also available on our website through bostonmpo.org backslash destination 2050. Uh, the survey is open through January 20th, which is next Friday. Um, if you, you know, can share this survey with your networks, you know, that would be extremely helpful to us as we're trying to get, you know, as many responses as we can um, to inform the decisions that the MPO will be making. Next slide, please. 
So um, kind of what will follow on, on this discussion and some of the work we'll be doing over the next couple of weeks um, is kind of working towards a final draft. Um, you know, there's certainly in terms of opportunities to provide feedback, um, you know, you're definitely welcome to contact me um, to uh, attend future MPO meetings where this is discussed, um, you know, whatever communication kind of works for you. Um, we're going to also continue to monitor the survey, as I spoke about, and we're hoping to share an updated version of the um, vision goals and objectives sometime next month um, for the MPO's ultimate approval. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, the discussion, and I'll just kind of um, frame it a little bit and then and turn it back over to the chair. Um, we definitely appreciate your, your input on those high level questions that I laid out at the beginning. You know, what elements of what we've been producing should we keep? What should we refine or build on? And where might we want to change course? And Stella, could you go to the next slide, please? I do also want to highlight that within the um, memo document, and I think um, there listed on the third or fourth page is a series of more specific discussion questions um, that we put to the MPO members in a workshop we had in December, um, and we'd definitely be interested um, in hearing um, your feedback on these as well. And they range from, you know, some specific elements like the VMT reduction objective that I mentioned uh, to broader questions like what seems to be missing and, you know, are there ways we should, you know, reflect prioritization of some of these goals and objectives um, in the framework we're producing. Um, so thank you very much for your attention and I'll turn it back over to the chair. And I think you're muted there. Thanks, sorry about that. You know, so thank you, Michelle. Uh, and I'm gonna pull up the participant screen so I can see people's hands as they go up. So, so yeah, please feel free to chime in, you know, Susan, and then Jen. Oh, hi. Um, yeah, thank you for all of this. Um, I was wondering if there would be a way within this planning process to do some of the planning that I was um, talking about, you know, can we get down to the nitty gritty of just mapping out kind of the most ideal transit system um, for the uh, at least the Boston MPO region, which is a very large region, and then um, figuring out kind of the most comprehensive way to move forward and um, filling the gaps in that system so that it's well coordinated and funded and all of that. Michelle? Thanks, Susan. Um, and again, um, kind of reflecting on the previous conversation, um, I know that we brought up uh, the transit working group was discussed. Um, that's on a little bit of a hiatus right now as we're working towards identifying a new um, staff person to manage that group. Uh, but, you know, definitely there are opportunities um, potentially through the UPWP. And I, I think I noticed someone submitting um, an idea uh, in the chat box that will definitely account for. Um, one of the other elements of the uh, long range transportation plan um, that I identified at the beginning is our kind of identification of of needs and we do that by producing a needs assessment. Um, and our hope has always been that this would be, you know, not something that we would update every four years, but some kind of living ongoing updated resource um, and there could be potential um, as having that be a component of this um, ongoing picture of you know, the range of services in the region and where the gaps are and where they aren't. Um, so even if that's not something we can do um, by the adoption of our plan this summer, you know, to the extent that the needs assessment is kind of an ongoing thing that we're maintaining with new data and new information, there may be opportunities to connect that um, to that broader coordination discussion as well. Yeah, and now might be a good time for me to also mention the, um coordinated uh, human um, transportation plan, you know, and I guess it's a coordinated public transit human services transportation plan, which is also done kind of in parallel being to the LRTP uh, meeting. And so uh, if Betsy uh, is still available and maybe want to speak to that for a little bit, you know, I welcome her input. Uh, 
Betsy Harvey? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, Hi everyone, Betsy Harvey. I run the Transformation Equity Program for the MPO, also in charge of the Coordinated Human Services Transportation Plan. Um, I guess generally the plan is kind of done in concert with the um, LRTP every four years to kind of align the input that we get from both the coordinated plan and the LRTP, for, particularly from seniors and people with disabilities. Um, I mean, to, to Franny's, uh, I think it was Franny who mentioned a couple of minutes ago, or Susan, um, talked about, you know, how where are there gaps in the network? Uh, one of the things that does go into the plan is all transportation, um, public transportation that exists in the region. Um, it's not an interactive format. It is in PDF, at least in the last plan it is. So that is something that... Um, that is that is available to at least see where there is where there is service um but yeah i mean the goal of the plan it's it's mostly to um the, the original goal is to support people and, and municipalities if they apply for a 5310 grant which is a community transit grant program administered by MassDOT. um you have to have a, a project that meets a need identified in the plan but it is it is um, a very practical planning document and, and could potentially be used in other other ways to better understand kind of where are their needs and gaps of particular populations populations in our region. Are there any particular questions that folks have about it? I'm happy to happy to answer those as well. Thank you, Betsy. We'll probably um, ask to have a, a deeper conversation with you about that plan, or at least as leading up to it. So, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, so Jen, Jen, Jen Rowe. Sure, thank you. Um, so first I just wanted to say a huge thank you to Michelle. Like I, um, it was really, really uh, exciting to read the the new draft. Like I just feel like you did such a great job incorporating a lot of what um, the conversation here was and I'm sure like from so many other sources and I, I really think it's headed in a much more, um, like easy to digest direction um, and also like aligned with my sense of where um, conversations people are, are wanting things to go. So um, so thank you for that. Um, and I did want to just like very quickly answer the questions that I also really appreciate you outlined as <laughs> like what would be most helpful for you to know. Um, so from my personal opinion, um, I do support the proposal to integrate equity and have its own goal. Um, and I actually really love that graphic you showed at the beginning um, and uh, where it was kind of in the center. Um, and almost wonder if the, um, like when you have these, oh, sorry, you can't really see this, <laughs> the, the sheets um, with uh, all the goals outlined, maybe there might be a way to actually use that organizing principle to, to make that um, clear and um, uh, where, where those, uh, pieces are connecting into that that center goal. Um, that was the first one. Um, the I do support the Vision Zero oriented statement and the safety goal. I think that's fantastic and um, as an organizing principle in that area. Um, the one piece um, I might suggest there is um, being very explicit about the because um, you say for all modes, and of course I think that's absolutely true. Um, I do think that sometimes. The, when you say, if you like look at like the pure numbers of crashes, if you say like all modes and don't necessarily specify like particularly for vulnerable road users and um, like with an emphasis on like fatalities and serious injuries, um, you know, like I just want, and I'm sure that's like already in the thought process, but um, maybe I think that might be worth kind of carrying actually specifying in the um, actual objective. Um, then I, I also like the, I think the, the organization of Mobility, reliability, and access connectivity is great. Um, I one thing that I struggle with a lot, and <laughs> not that I have like the best figured out the best way to, to talk about this, but is um, uh, in the access and connectivity, um, being able to be very clear when we're talking about connectivity and when we're talking um, when we're talking about access in that in this. The same kind of sentiment as connectivity and when it's like specifically access for people with disabilities um uh and so i think making that that that's one kind of thing overarching that i would want to maybe see brought out a little bit more is like um specific that that access for people um with disabilities um spoken and in, in, uh pulled out 
separately. Um, and then um, do, do, do. I, I do think um, in terms of VMT and mode shift, I think those goals, I saw them some places um, in, in the framework and uh, appreciated that. Um, and I do think there might be places here and there, and I'll try to like mark up a thing and provide more particular suggestions um, where um, kind of being clear about the prioritization, mode-based prioritization within some of these goals, if that makes sense, um, like where, which ones we're most concerned about in terms of reliability and which ones were most, like which modes we're most concerned about with safety, et cetera. Um, and yeah, I think that is the overarching, um, overarching comments. I'll try to uh, send over a more um, detailed piece. And also um, one of my colleagues uh, who's an engineer uh, took a look too and, and noted some points that I thought were, um, I'll share his, his markup too, because it was really interesting seeing someone who's very in the weeds on like very specific projects and, uh, and then seeing this very like overarching concept. And like, there are certain things that were like, like triggered him to be like, oh wait, like I really wanna make sure this is clear because sometimes like this particular word gets wielded in a way you might not expect. Um, so anyway, but thank you so much. Like I think just having, being able to sh like share this with colleagues, like I think it was so much easier to, for people to kind of see how it relates to their work than, um, previous iterations. So it's been come a long way. So thank you. Thank you, Jen. Um, Franny? Yeah, I um, wanted to ask a comment and a question. Um, when you're talking about safety, it made me think of health. And I don't know if it fits in here. But it's not like the safety of the people as they use the transportation. But the more transportation is available, the better quality of life and the health of people um, that they have. I'm picturing somebody in my town who just really needed a blood test on a weekend to prevent a hospital stay, but didn't know how she would get home from the hospital after just getting the blood test. So she avoided it, which would lead to more um, medical intervention, whatever it was, it was just all based on transportation. Um, um, and so I don't know if it's beyond the scope of thinking about transportation, but when I think about Medicare or insurance companies or um, Medicaid, somehow having a stake, having a um, participation in our transportation planning so that they see that their patients are as best as possible getting to their appointments and needs. Anyway, I was just thinking about that connection. Um, also, the question is sort of for Susan Barrett. Um, I love your idea of, of specifically putting, having specific plans for transportation on the plan. And I was just curious what it looks like um, in your mind. Um, what does that look like on the page? Like if, if the plan includes that, what does it look like? Can you um, describe that? Because I, I just love the idea of really getting down to the brass tacks um, in the plan, but I just want to make sure that I have this, the right or that we all have the right image that you're talking about. Uh, yeah, well, thank you for it's It's my dream to share. Oh. Um, sort of like what um, yeah, I'm thinking. Um, so you, you already have, of course, the, the Boston MPO service area. And we know we have, um, when you think about MBTA and bus network redesign, right? We see those maps. We see where they're planning to have bus service, where it's um, going to be high, pre have high frequency and where it's not and so on. Something like that, but just for the entire area. And then, of course, we're going to end up with a lot of gaps, right? something that maps out like um, it'll say like who's going to manage that service is it TMA is it municipal um, I think we have to do some planning that's more at the state level as well I mean when I think about the the, the uh, plethora of demand services like the health and human services plan um, transportation we have ADA paratransit now granted that is by region but you know we have that um, you know, we have a variety of 
demand responsive transportation that maybe could be pooled together, um, you know, with become more of that one call, one click type service. Um, and I know this has been talked about for ages. So really just actually going that next step to map it out. Um, and uh, to follow up on that, my, the reason I had my hand raised, and it was, I guess, a comment maybe for Betsy. Um, when I look at the coordinated public transit human services transportation plan, I, um, you know, we get to the point of having potential strategies and actions outlined. And I'm just wondering if we could then get to that next step about how we would actually make those actions come to life. Like I, I look at this, uh, at least the current plan, and it says, you know, provide more frequent bus service in suburban communities. Okay, then the next step, how do we actually do that? <laughs> or um, um, provide direct transit service between senior centers and medical centers. I mean, really any of these things, you know, how do we then make it come to be? If this is really the best ideas, then how can we um, move these ideas off of paper and into reality? Thank you. So I'll, I'll go to Betsy and then, then come back to Michelle, just in case she wants to comment on anything that she's heard. I'll go to John and then me, and then we'll see how much time is left. Okay, so Betsy. Uh, thanks, Len. Just real quick, uh, Susan. So one of the things that's perhaps not as highlighted as, as much in that particular coordinated plan, the last one, but is something that we are, we is it is mandatory to be in there is a discussion of priorities. And so that doesn't necessarily get at like, are we doing X, Y, like what specifically is on the ground we're we doing that can start to get at being more deliberate and more extens expansive on that section of, of the coordinated plan about what what about what do we prioritize? What do we want to prioritize? What do we think the region should prioritize? You know, and getting and, and using groups like RTAC and, and other stakeholders to get that information, I think could help start the conversation. And there's no, there's no restriction per se on like going further than that and saying like we could put in more information about what you know more more concrete actions it's just that's it's never it's not explicitly required so definitely we're putting together the plan this year um as this we'll be doing more engagement um in the spring in the winter and spring Stella and i um so we can certainly explore kind of more more concrete ideas to put in the plan if, if that's if that's useful susan if you're talking we can't hear you yeah. I was just saying thank you. Okay, okay. I thought so, but just to make sure. Michelle? Oh, yeah. I just, you know, you mentioned bring it, bringing it back to me, and I, I just want to thank everybody for kind of your, your ideas um, and suggestions, um, you know, definitely sparking an idea, a lot of, a lot of thinking about, you know, where things intersect, and I, I was, you know, really thinking about that in terms of, you know, Franny's comment and how, you know, within this structure, we can, you know, emphasize um, some more of those intersections, um, hopefully without not having too many goals or too many individual objectives. But um, yeah, it's, it's, I, I do appreciate, you know, the thought that that people, um, you all are putting into your suggestions and, and very much appreciate it. So, John? Yeah, um, thank you. Quite a comprehensive plan, and I, uh, I admire your um, changes. Uh, I think we've made a huge change in terms of uh, making uh, the equity. It's a really a moral compass now uh, change uh, versus a, it being based on a moral issue uh, and um, versus a functional issue, let's say. Uh, of safety and or you know, state of good repair or things like that is the priority. So it's very aspirational. Uh, back to Susan's points, and I think a lot of our desires, we need to get a lot more, you know, where's the beef? Where's the on the ground implementation reality of how do we get from there to, you know, here to there uh, and implementation realities? Uh, modes, plans, um, having it real so that people can access it next year in 2025, whatever, but real modes that get people 
anywhere in the anywhere in our MPO to where they need to be. First mile, last mile is going to be a huge obstacle, even if we got a huge network that was very comprehensive. Um, two other things. Uh, one, uh, you, there were a couple of questions. What elements are missing from the proposed visions? What are um, what could be made to be better fulfilled? Uh, I think back to Susan's point, the implementation details need to be there. Secondly, I think we just need to, we, regrettably, we, we avoid dealing with funding. We've got to have a, a real big discussion and advocacy from the MPO on funding and take it to the legislature, leap outside of our, our neutrality and get into issues. Should it be, if we're trying to impact vehicle miles traveled and mode shifts and congestions, should VMT for all vehicles be measured like in a utility meter uh, monthly and, and, and assessed monthly like a, a meter and having that put into various priorities, maybe the single occupancy vehicle miles get put into funding a truly comprehensive transit or multi-person uh, conveyance. Okay, and just it's got to it's got to happen. I mean, the discussion has been kicked down the the road, uh, and it's 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 going to be a tough one. You know, a lot of people are going to talk about human right, you know, their individual rights being compromised or whatever. But are we a commonwealth or not? Okay, are we going to deal with our our common issues in a common way? to benefit everyone with this new moral compass of equity? Okay, that's one. And just another item, this is more of a detail. Um, should we build this plan also recognizing and factoring in a lot of the advances of technology and um, uh, artificial intelligence? that we had not really envisioned before. A lot of technology hasn't even surfaced yet. Look back 25 years ago, <laughs> did we anticipate drones being used in warfare as broadly as they are, using the airspaces? That was transportation. That was your all surface transportation based, okay? Maybe the aeronautics division should also be uh, anticipated in turn or the airspaces. Uh, I'm not living in the Jetsons era yet, but uh, there has been talk about utilizing not just uh, you know rideshare vehicles or things like that, but delivery vehicles or delivery by air, drones, uh, or are there going to be flying cars? I mean, should any of that be factored in? Self driving. Drones, self-driving uh, air cars. I mean, should some of the regional airports be transportation access into the core? I don't know, but there's things that maybe uh, can be factored in. That's just again, I'm getting back into dreamland, but in uh, the idealistic uh, revolution. But uh, uh, I think it's it's well done. There's a lot of good thinking going on here, and a lot of room for. Um, a lot of room for input. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. So let's say I'll go. Then um, we'll let um, um, Stella maybe wrap us up with a couple of details, maybe you know, things you want to, to tell us, I mean, and then um, if we have time, we'll come to um, Anna Christina. I mean, so uh, regarding whether we should list um, priorities in alphabetical order, uh, I mean, and um, prioritize them, I'm going to say put them in alphabetical order. And it harkens back I mean, to um, a discussion at the MPO meeting, I mean, where you had like you showed that ranking slide, I mean, and and the chair, you know, I don't know if he was being flipped, I mean, or what, but he seemed a little serious to me when he said, I me mean, with the bottom ones, like people don't care about it, I mean, uh, uh, and and he characterized it as like the lower ones people don't care about. And I'm afraid we'll get into that situation 
if we rank them, you know, and as much as much we might say it's important, if they see at the bottom and we say we prioritize, it'll come across as we don't care about it. So I would just say put them in alphabetical order. Uh, when it comes to the priorities, the prioritization, I think that comes out of the criteria. You could say like a trip, it's a chicken and egg thing. Like, well, we be based on the, the numbers and the criteria based on our priorities. But right now we have the criteria, meaning so we can just say the priorities pop out of the criteria. And if we don't like the priorities, then we redo the criteria and then the priorities will crop, pop out of those criteria. Um, Vision Zero, I think is a little tricky, you know, but it kind of harkens back to what John said. Look, when it comes to youth and safety, we, as long as we, we, you can't solve that human problem, I mean, unless you stop young people from driving, I mean, you know, youth and driving is just going to be problematic until youth aren't doing the driving. You can say that for most humans, I mean, and so that's the only thing that is going to stop me from saying autonomous vehicles anymore is because if, if we're going to get to Vision Zero, we're going to have to stop the human machines from driving and let the in silico machines do the driving and we'll get there eventually. You know, now in terms of what we should have um, um, as in, in, you, you can combine mobility, reliability and accessibility and connectivity. connectivity. Mobility to me, I mean, it's kind of like the superset, you know, I mean, so when I think like, like what is mobility? I mean, I can't like, I can't really wrap my head around like accessibility, I kind of get. I mean, you can say like every house has access to transit and transportation. Connectivity is clear to me too, because you could say, well, every house has access to transit, but you can only go to a couple locations. Whereas if you have a lot of locations, then it's like, that's great connectivity. I get that, I get reliability. I don't quite get mobility. So I would suggest maybe just dropping mobility and then kind of splitting out the other, having mobility, I mean, sorry, connectivity, accessibility, I mean, and reliability, you know? So just a suggestion. Uh, I liked economic vitality. I, mean, I would bring that one back, you know, because I think I mean, it has it has a really big equity component. I think you can kind of get, get housing in there too. It, um, it has a, an environmental justice component, it, and and I also think it just has a broader appeal to to businesses too. So I kind of hate to see that one go. Oh um, man, I mean, and 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 um and yes, I, I like the emphasis. I mean. I guess I, I I like what you have with in terms of um, clean air and and health. I mean, and I guess kind of along the lines of economic vitality, viability, and vitality has that kind of notion of sustainability too. Because because the only way you're going to have economic vitality is if you have a sustainable community. You know, so so um, so that's it. You know, I think I got through everything. I'm sorry, you know, it took a little bit longer, but I'm going to stop there and go over to Stella for a couple of announcements, and then we'll see if people want to hang around. For a couple of minutes to hear Anna Christina Stella. Thanks, Glenn. I will be quick. Um, I just wanted to flag, I, I dropped a link earlier in the chat to um, our UPWP study submission survey that we have open currently um, through February 15th. That is an opportunity for um, anyone and everyone to, to propose a study idea to the MPO for funding. Um, in, in FFY 2024. Um, and obviously this committee, our TAC will be involved in kind of the, the um, oversight and selection process as the UPWP develops, but you know, you're also welcome to submit survey idea, study ideas, excuse me, um, and please feel free to, to share um, with your networks if you know of anyone who might be interested in kind of proposing an idea that the MPO study or fund the study of. Um, I just dropped the link again, uh, just wanted to flag that. And the survey should contain a link to some study submission guidelines, some examples of what we're looking for, um, and then contact information for Shreelika Murthy, our UPWP manager. Um, we're happy to meet offline with anyone to kind of um, work through, talk through details um, if you're looking to propose something and, and want some assistance. Um, so you, if you don't want to, um, if you can also just feel free to contact me and I can put you in touch with, with her about that. So just wanted to flag that. Um, we'd love to hear your ideas. Great, thanks, Stella. And so we're going to go to Anna Christina and then after you close, Anna Christina, you're going to give us a motion to adjourn, okay? Okay, no, I just wanted to make John happy and let him know that there has been talk about organizing airspace recently um, by using, utilizing small hub airports. So 
whether that's for drones, drone drop off for shipments, or even for maybe someday flying cars, just to make John happy. That's it. And I would like to make a motion to adjourn. Making John happy is a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> Can I get a second? Did John leave? No, we've got the second for John. There we go. You know, so uh, so without uh, any further ado, we adjourn, folks. Thank you. Thank you for hanging in there for a long meeting. Appreciate it. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. So I'm going to hang in Hello. a little bit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I forgot what I was going to say. Yeah, what was I going to say, Stella? I wanted to ask you something.